methods that I use to end up this quick experiment. And we're going to talk about some results. We're going to do some exploration. And we're going to conclude. So topological data analysis is this method of looking at data that is kind of distinct from your normal like kind of statistical methods, where you look at like means or standard deviations or like further moments. Right? And the idea is that you quantify the shape of your data. Right? And you use this using methods from like a very uh, an area of pure math called like uh, topology, obviously. Um, so the idea, uh, our first figure here just illustrates kind of like the limits of descriptive statistics because like you can kind of like morph it and make many different shapes with it, um, but have the same kind of metric. So the idea here with topological data analysis is that you take your data, you analyze it as this big point cloud, right? And you and you consider a ball of radius, like epsilon or r, really it doesn't matter what you call it, uh, around each data point and you grow it, right? And then you analyze the the sh like the holes in like your structure as you grow epsilon. And the idea is that the holes that last longer as a function of epsilon are like more prominent, and therefore they characterize your data more, right? And you can see this in this figure here, where like as it grows more, eventually some other hole is gonna. So a hole was already born here, and it, it's it's grow it's getting sh it's shrinking and shrinking, and then it dies, right? So the idea is you you record the birth and the death of your holes, and that is a characteristic kind of thing. So to just run through the pipeline a little more cleanly, you start with a point cloud, you turn it into a simplicial complex, which is a whole mathematical structure, but essentially it, it amounts to those epsilon balls, and you consider like connecting all of the points, like when the epsilon balls actually connect. Right? You can see with greater epsilon, like like it's in, like your uh, simplicial complex changing in different amounts of holes, right? And that's the idea of a homology group, like characterizing like the actual amount of holes. And then you create this thing called a persistence diagram, which is what I showed before here. Um, and so basically, yeah, it, it records the birth and death of your holes, and then what you do is in order to actually kind of use that to get more like clean, you know, single variable statistics, uh, you can do this thing where you you make a persistence landscape, which is essentially you take your diagram and you just like turn it 45 degrees, essentially. It's kind of like a simplification, but like that's the idea. And then you kind of take a norm. So usually it's just kind of the integral under the curve. Um, or it can be like, that integral can like depend on like this variable, like it's an LP norm, right? It's like, yeah, there's really not that much to it. Essentially, the big idea here is that we're going from like statistics to topology, like very deep into topology, and then back into statistics so that we can kind of, you know, well, for our purposes, we want statistics because what we're going to do is kind of put this into a machine learning pipeline. I probably should have said this before. Um, okay, the other idea, you know, topological insights on vector embedded language is the idea of vector embedded language. And this is the idea of word embedding. So essentially, um, in the world of natural language processing, it's quite useful to consider words as vectors, right? Because like that's just a move of data science, right? Um, so there are a lot of different methods of making word embeddings. Um, classical methods usually rely on like linear algebra ideas, like uh, singular value decomposition. And more modern, more modern takes use like neural methods, right? So like some famous names you'll hear in this world of NLP include Wurzebeck, Glove, and Bert. Um, you don't really need some of these names. The idea is that word vectors are powerful because you can kind of capture analogies with them and like word similarities, right? So similar words will obviously uh, be closer together. Um, and you can kind of capture how like, so for example, if you start with king and you subtract man and you add woman, you're supposed to get queen. And that actually kind of works out in some of these more like advanced word embedding techniques, uh, which is kind of powerful. So just how word embeddings like, so I'm gonna talk about words of X specifically here because that's what I use in my experiments. Um, the idea is like, essentially, uh, to create word embeddings in this in this context, what you do is you keep track of all the words. So you, you think about words like in like a large corpus, and you train a neural net to predict the context of each word. So, um, for example, here I ate broccoli and I somehow thoroughly enjoyed it or enjoyed it thoroughly. So the green words are the context. The yellow word is the word itself. And what you do is um, you try to predict, or well, you don't try to predict. You you make the probability of context of uh, context like conditioned on each word, and you try to like optimize your predictions of context. And the idea is that like, this is like, this is a really like smart and clever method because it's self-supervised, right? You could just take like a large corpus of text and you could just like go over each word. And essentially what you do in neural nets is you kind of train like these weights, right? And the weights that we want here are like the first layer of weights because those kind of take words from like their discrete setting into this hidden layer. And this hidden layer is powerful because like that is like what we then transfer to other machine learning techniques so that we can start using those, like we can just feed those in directly. And we already have some sense of the words that's much more statistical 
and much more powerful than like black boxes because computers can't understand words; they can understand vectors. Um, so the motivation of this project was um, that word embeddings. If you think about language, right? Language is kind of like a trajectory in like high dimensional word embedding space, right? So you can analyze that trajectory perhaps, and you can probably yield insights on like the style, the intent, the plot structure of whatever kind of statement you're looking at. So my idea was to apply TDA to this area of natural language processing. And I had a few hypotheses. One was that you know a larger like norm, so if we go back to like the idea of like a norm, it's like uh, a larger norm will kind of give you perhaps a larger diversity of vocabulary, or it like should at least correspond to that. And then it should kind of perhaps correspond to some sense of creativity. These are kind of like the, the assumptions you make in NLP, like they're very broad, but like you, you work with what you can. And then another idea is that uh, monitoring this norm, it's a more general hypothesis that like you can actually use this to distinguish styles between authors. And this was obviously the, the hypothesis we tested because it's, it's just more tractable in a lot in a sense. So uh, we kind of just took a very simple uh, spooky author identification data set, that's what it was called. Um, and the task was to predict whether a given excerpt from a certain poem was written by one of three authors. Uh, very famous author. Um, and our method, so compared to like other methods, was that we converted the text into a sequence of word embeddings. We split the sequence into like n point clouds, like distinct point clouds over the sequence of like the poem or like the statement. And then we applied the norm to each cloud, like after doing the whole topological data analysis pipeline, which we went through before, very fast. Uh, and then we used this as a feature in like a very simple machine learning um, like pipeline. In this case, it was just logistic regression. And then we compared this to some like alternatives, which are kind of common in NLP, which is like, if you have a bunch of vectors and you kind of just want to condense it into a smaller amount, you can do like max pooling or some pooling, like min pooling is not really a thing, but like I just did it anyway. Um, and the idea is like, that is another way of characterizing your data. And that kind of reflects more of those descriptive statistics we talked about earlier in the talk, uh, which TDA beats, hopefully. Uh, and it does. Uh, but uh, if you look at these results, obviously, uh, the first thing to notice, and you just like kind of a point of humility, is that word vectors are actually not even good for this task. Which is something I didn't really expect. Like just using a bag of words model where you literally just use word, word counts is like much more effective. So keep that in mind. Um, but if you compare with uh, like the pooling, so like the max pooling and some pooling, kind of ignore min pooling. I just did it for fun, really. Um, but you notice that like uh, so you start off with like lower uh, accuracies when you have like just five point clouds. But when you split it into higher point clouds, you actually get higher accuracy. And this is kind of corresponds perhaps to our idea of, you know, um, the, the, top, the topological signature playing out. You know, because if you can actually like monitor that norm over the course of you know, someone's writing, then perhaps you're actually characterizing some sense of how they write. Um, and we also just did some other fun explorations and visualization. So like if you look at like these poems, some of these are not even in the data set, as like, you know, point clouds kind of just get like interesting shapes, and you notice that they do look different, right? And just to note, like this is a misrepresentation because, or it's a simplification because the word vectors are actually 300 dimensional. This is a PCA projection down to three dimensions. Uh, but you still capture some of that shape, right? And that's important, right? Because it's kind of like central to our hypothesis. Uh, we also looked at persistence diagrams for these three, and you do notice they're quite different. So this is looking at kind of some of the Poles. Like these are like not just like one-dimensional poles like the normal ones you kind of know about like like a torus hole. There's also um, zero-dimensional holes, which is like just literally the distance between points, and that that's monitored I think mostly on that like zero axis um, because they're born immediately, right? So that's why the birth is at zero, but the death could be higher. Um, but then you also have like higher-dimensional holes, which are like cavities, and then like higher-dimensional cavities, which yeah, they can't visualize. Um, yeah, that's important to keep in mind. And you do notice they they look different, so it's important. Uh, we also like track the LP norm of no poems over the course of the poem because like why not? Seems kind of interesting. Um, and okay, so this is kind of related to so like when you track LP norms, there's actually been like some work in the literature um, in, related to like other things, not NLP, but like financial time series like monitoring, which is that like if you can like analyze the um, you can actually get a sense of market instability before the, a crash happens um, using TDA. Or like, so the author said, like this is something my advisor wrote, so I'm just gonna take him at face value. So like, we just kind of looked at other poems. Um, I think uh, I don't really have like it on me now, so I'm not gonna like try to like point out like where these 
peaks and troughs actually like fit with poem, fit, fit with the words in the poem. But the idea is, remember from like our earlier kind of hypotheses, was that like you know like sharp changes in the norm should correspond to some kind of sharp change in the language, um, which you know th this is all just speculation. This is fun stuff. Another little graph, um, but just to keep in mind, right? Like this is uh, very much a starting project. There's a lot of kind of future work on like what TDA can be done, what TDA can be helpful for in NLP. Um, you could put it into more advanced neural net structures. You can consider contextual word embeddings as opposed to just the more simple ones like words of X. And perhaps you can use TDA for that kind of like change point detection, right? Like what if you can like analyze a plot over the course of like a novel and you could use like this LP norm to like, you know, predict when some character is going to betray another character or something crazy like that. So um, yeah, that's the end of my talk. Uh, thank you for listening. What is the runtime of your effect compared to some games? Oh, uh, How much more time takes from the game? It's definitely longer. That's an important thing. Um, I, I don't have the numbers. But like, I do know, uh, it's something important to note is that it does significantly uh, decrease as you increase n. Because like when you have like a large point cloud, um, like the, obviously like the, the time it takes to like consider all the epsilon balls and then like the simplest of complexes goes up. But if you actually have higher granularity, you, only, you not only get better accuracy, but you get better runtime. So that's like an important kind of thing to keep in mind. Yep. Can you just get out of curiosity, but were there any like significant differences between the time of creativity that we're talking about? How do you measure creativity? <laughs> yeah, so it's just like, I guess, like big LP norm differences between. Between like poems? Yeah, just like at different times, I guess, within the poem. I mean, like, that, that was just kind of like, more of amusing. But I imagine like it, it really could be, um, like that there are ways of testing it. Like you could probably create like some data set that has like generally more creative statements.